Good morning. It's Tuesday, so it's time for us to continue with our study of the book of 1 Peter. Um, just bear with me while I um, work to get this shared out. It's always a challenge kind of going through that. But yeah, today we're beginning a brand new section, beginning with 1 Peter 3, verse 3, uh, uh, 3 verse 13. And um, the uh, it's going to be an, an, an interesting study because it's the, the topic in this section is, you know, depending on the commentary or the or the or the book that you're reading in this area is about undeserved suffering. Um, basically, suffering that Christ followers may endure um, in an environment where. continuing to follow Christ even while you are going through crap, right, that you believe is unfair, that it's completely unjustified, and it's making you angry, it's pissing you off, whatever, but you continue to follow Christ. And when we say we're continuing to follow Christ, that means we continue to follow through his example um, and live the way that he is wanting us to live. So, um, so that's going to be what the topic of this session, and, and the section is from uh, uh, is in chapter three, verse three, thirteen, verses twenty-two. And as usual, we'll continue, try to continue through about thirty minutes ish, depending on how we we go. Um, there's areas in this section where I'm going to talk about what appears to be contradictions, and but if you dig into the word more deeply and take scripture as a whole, matter of fact, if you just take this letter as a whole, you'll find that he's not being contradictory and you have to look into the meanings of certain words and it's going to happen in the beginning of the section during today so i'm going to talk into that um you know it's going to probably seem odd um that peter is nudging us in this section uh, perhaps not even very subtly it's very direct it's very real very it's kind of raw um to the ideal or, or to this idea that christ followers um are blessed even while they suffer for the sake of righteousness, you know, and similarly to it's similar to how he addressed the topic of suffering in verse in chapter two, verses 21 through 25. So the assertion is that through our sanctification process, which all of us, if we've been justified in the beginning, right, and that we were justified um, when we accepted Christ into our hearts and we agreed to follow him as our Lord and Savior. From that moment forward, we're going through the sanctification process, right? So the assertion is that as we go through this sanctification process, that Christ is sanctified in our hearts to the degree that non-believers um, or people that are observing, right, are going to ask us about our faith and that we in turn are prepared to give an answer, right? And they're going to observe us as they, they see, they know when you're going through stuff, they know that you're challenged to continue with your belief system and with your faith while stuff is happening around you. Um, I mean, good Lord, this is 2021 and we got stuff that's happening in our culture and in our societies. That's, that's challenging. They should be challenging to, to ardent um, and full fledged Christ followers. Um, Cause we should not accept what culture is trying to convince us is truth when we know that it's not truth. Right. But how do you do that and still exhibit love and empathy and compassion and caring when it's pissing you off as you watch this stuff happen. Um, so, but it's how we behave. It's it, it, and, and, and it's what flows out of our hearts that matters. And so they're watching that man. They are. And they're watching, they're looking for you to fall. They're looking for you to, 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 to be challenging. They're looking for you to lash out. Um, and when you don't, and you're just living a life of joy, even while this stuff is happening around you, it's gonna, gonna garnish some curiosity. You know, the bottom line is that Christ died to bring people like us to the Father, period, done. You know, and, and towards the end of this section, in this section, Peter's going to touch on the act of baptism um, as it relates to how Noah and his family were saved from the flood because of the ark. You know, death followed by resurrection. Um, Peter is advising us to be prepared to share um, why we have hope to maintain a good conscience. Um, and to remain aware of Christ's purpose and why he suffered. Uh, in, verses, uh, in, in verses 19 through 21 are touted as one of the most difficult passages to interpret in the Bible. I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know that if I have personally enough knowledge um, 
to to validate that so i'm kind of taking that into context based off of what other commentaries have said that that those sections are difficult to interpret i personally did not find them very difficult to interpret but that's based on my belief system my theology um and my perspective on things and so i understand that people have different perspectives so perhaps maybe it is challenging i don't know i didn't find it as challenging as some of the commentaries suggested um and uh, yet the revelation remains no matter what that christ suffered and that christ died for sin in order to bring his people to god and then finally peter points to christ's example of innocent suffering at the hands of this world's citizens um, Jesus's innocent suffering, death and resurrection and exaltation are the foundation for the salvation and vindication of believers. So um, in different commentaries have different titles. You know, if you go through if you go through a commentary Bible or a study Bible, they always they tend to title sections at the top and there's different ones. Um, undeserved suffering was a title in one or following Christ in bearing injustice was another Um but the bottom line is that this section is about continuing to follow Christ when temptation and pain and whatever you're So don't allow people to get into your heart and impact your belief system. That's kind of what I see this section is really about. So in verse 313, it starts, And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Um, this verse starts off almost kind of contradicting when you think about what Peter said in an earlier verse. So Peter states that if we are zealous for good, then who can harm us? Almost implying that if you're zealous for good, you can't be harmed, period. That's what it says. However, in verse, in verse tw uh, 2 uh, or in chapter 2, verse 20, he told us that if we suffer for doing good, then it's commendable to God. So in verse 3, 313, he's saying, you know, how can, how, who, who, how, who can harm you if you're zealous for good? But then he says in an earlier... But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, then you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be in dread. You know, it's unusual for anyone to hurt those who are benefiting society. And yet we're watching it happen anyway. So when the church tries to get involved, I'm talking about the body, not buildings or anything like that. But when we try to get involved to help um, to do things to help society, we get slammed and pushed back. They would rather have taxpayer dollars pay for stuff, right? No, let government take care of it. Let, let our tax dollars take care of it. By the way, give me my tax dollars back. It, it, it's just a very bizarre that, – that shows you how society is jacked up um, with what they're doing is – Give me my tax dollars back. How dare you? But church, you stay out of it. Let the government take care of it. Well, how can the government take care of anything if they have no tax dollars to take care of it, but yet you're demanding to give you your tax dollars back? It's, it's, it's odd. So it's unusual, but it happens, right, that um, for, anyone, for, for um, uh, anyone to hurt those who are benefiting society, but it happens. Um, it's unusual for people to want to hurt you when you are kind and caring. But it happens. Why? Because it's all about the perspective about what people have in their heads and in their hearts about what is kind and caring, right? Um, and there's different thoughts and different opinions about what it means to be kind and caring. It's take care of my household. Be kind, be kind to me before you're kind to them. Or it's be kind to others before you're kind to me. And so your perspective is going about what's kind and caring is going to be different. So that's why it happens. Um, even if, right? But even if you should suffer, so even if indicates that Peter was writing to people who were already suffering for their faith. Therefore, suffering is not improbable, right? It's expected. It's expected that you're going to suffer. But I, I don't, I get nervous around these words about suffer because suffering it has a different 
connotation depending on who you are and where you live in the world, right? Some people suffer. You call me a name, uh, right? I suffer because you called me a name, right? Sticks and stones and all that kind of whatever. But yet we got people in other parts of the world that are suffering physically. There's people, there's Christians being beheaded in the Middle East. So what is suffering, right? It's it, for some people, it's actual physical. It's a fear that they're going to get discovered. They're going to get in, pr- in China. They go to, they go to prison for years, right? Um, whereas other people suffer because, oh, you didn't treat me very fair. So, so anyway, this, there's a degree of suffering. Um, it seems contradictory though, right? Um, is that we would feel that, that people are going to hurt you even when you're benefiting society. People are going to hurt you even when you believe that you are being kind and caring, but it's going to happen. Um, and that you're going to suffer for your faith. Um, suffering's not improbable. It's expected, but it's, it seems contradictory. It's a symptom of a fallen world. That's it, right? It's a symptom of a fallen world. If you have a disease, your body behaves a certain way, right? It does. You're, you're lexadaisical. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're mentally, you know, um, um, you know, uh, exhausted, you know, whatever. Um, your body doesn't want to move. Your muscles ache. So when you have a disease and when you have a virus, when you have a bacteria, right, what happens is that, you know, it, it's, uh, your body is fighting yourself. So it's a symptom of, it's like, it's a symptom of a fallen world, the suffering. So after telling us in verse 220, that if we suffer for doing good, then it's commendable to God. And then in 313, that if we're zealous for good, then who can harm us? Peter continues in 314 by advising us that even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, then we are blessed. Okay. It's kind of close to semantics, but it's not. Being blessed implies privilege and honor. It's a privilege and an honor. If you're a Christ follower, and if you're an ardent Christ follower, then it's an honor and it's a privilege to continue to follow Christ no matter what. Don't give up. What do you do when, you're, when, you're ha- when you have an obstacle, when you have a financial issue, when, you're, when, when things are just being torn apart right in your life, in your workplace, or whatever? You persevere. You continue to push through. You gather up your strength and your courage, and you push, and you push through. You don't give up. You don't give up. You don't quit. You keep going. Well, the same thing is if you're a Christ follower, if you are being, if you are suffering because of you following Christ and the mandates that Christ has placed on our lives, then it is a blessing and an honor to continue to push through that. That's the way, that's the life of a Christ follower. In James 1 verse 2, James writes, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You know, when you get through a trial, you know, when you're going, you know, they say getting through something, but when you get through a trial and at the end it's over, right? You have just been tested by fire. They call it fiery ordeals in the previous section. And so it's just, it's tested your faith, right? But it makes you feel good, right? That you got through it. Um, in verse 210 and in, v, in verse 314, Peter uses the Greek word pasco or pasho for suffer. This word means to experience a sensation um, or an impression that is usually painful. However, it's not necessarily a reference to things that are physical, right? Suffering can come in many forms, um, such as, you know, uh, emotional torment, um, society and cultural torment. Um, or it can be slander. It can be gossip. Your feelings can get hurt. You can be offended, you know, all that kind of stuff. In verse 313, Peter used the Greek word uh, kaku, K-A-K-O-O, for harm. And this means to injure or to exasperate. It's a reference to being highly irritated or frustrated. So let's go back to 313, where it says, there can be no harm to you if you prove zealous for what is good, right? That if you are doing what is, is what it is good, right, then who can irritate you and who can frustrate you, right? That's what that implies. The harm doesn't necessarily mean physical harming. It, it doesn't mean, you know, um, that you're walking around bitter, um, you know, or, or antagonistic towards others. So if you are doing, if you are zealous for what is good, no matter what is happening around you, then why would you feel irritated or frustrated? You just continue to do what you're doing. You know, um, and continue to be zealous for good. You know, in Romans 8, 31, Paul asks us that if God is for us, who's against us? Well, those opposed to God are against us. And they're going to endeavor to make life 
hard and difficult difficult for us at times. Some of them all the time. Um, when Peter is making reference to suffering in two twenty in verse three in verse two twenty and verse three fourteen, he's telling us that Christians are definitely going to suffer. It's going to happen. Non Christians suffer too, by the way. But but again, he's writing. This is this is mostly for believers. That's who he's writing to, right? So Christians are definitely going to suffer. It's going to happen. But then in three thirteen. He's saying that we won't come to harm from the suffering if we remain focused on what is good in the eyes of God. Believers may receive verbal backlash. Um, Christians are going to receive ridicule. I mean, look, we got all this gender junk, you know, happening in Congress. The guy, a men and a women. What the frick is that? That's that's freaking idiotic and freaking moronic, right? Um, and because we say and we believe that that's moronic and freaking stupid because a man just means so be it. What is a woman? Nothing. That is them trying to be politically correct and trying to convince you and to sell you on an ideal. That's a freaking lie. That's exactly what that is. But because we believe that, because we say that, no one's going to say anything to me in this video, by the way. No one's going to say anything to me, right? But if you have a thousand followers, if you have two thousand followers, if you have five thousand, if you have a following and you have like a huge impact and influence on people, you're going to get attacked for saying what I just said, right? So um, we're going to receive verbal backlash. We're going to receive ridicule We're going to, and more, but it can only harm you. It can only irritate and frustrate you um, when that happens if you allow it, right? Or if you decide to take God out of the equation, right? And that's going to be a challenge. That's a challenge for a lot of men in particular, right? Is that when we see this stuff happening is, you know, we just want to go on the attack, man. Um, and uh, that's not necessarily um, Christ-like. However, um, we have to take into context about who's been called um, by God for certain things and to do certain jobs, um, who's got an anointing, um, which means if you've been called by God or if you have an and or if you have the anointing, then the, God, the Lord will, have a, will ha equip you in order to respond in a, in, in, um, um, under the, um, the guidance and protection of the Holy Spirit and God as you go through things. Po uh, politicians um, are a great example of that. So Peter concludes this verse with a basic reference to Isaiah um, chapter 8, verses 12 to 13, inspiring believers not to be intimidated, right? This is where we talk about Christians, right? There's strength. You can have courage, have courage, but not to be intimidated by those who are trying to irritate and frustrate you, right, or to harm you, but to face them with the fear of God. Intimidation in this verse is the Greek word phobos, which means to be put in fear. So Peter is advise, uh, advised in this regard is to continue to, sancti to, to, to sanctify Christ, um, which he digs more into in verse 15. The actual uh, verse from uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, you are not to say it is a conspiracy, regarding everything that this people call a conspiracy and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it is the lord of armies whom you are to regard as holy and he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread so the bottom line is do you fear man more than you fear god um if you fear man more than you fear god that's when your irritation and frustration um, is going to become a part of your life, and you're going to act out and lash out out of that irritation and that frustration rather than in a way that is righteous and, you know, a little bit more um, graceful. If you fear God more than you fear man, it's, it's like sticks and stones, man. This stuff should, should kind of bounce off. However, it does not mean that we shouldn't speak out when this idiotic stuff is happening, such as... Um, what some of our Congress people, I guess we can't say congressmen or congresswomen anymore. They've made gender rules in Congress now. I guess I can't be Johnson. I got to be John's child, you know, because it's got son in it, which is gender specific to a male, right? A son is a man. You know, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's stupid. But, you know, you can't, it, anyway, I'm a rabbit trail. I don't want to do that. So in verse 15, um, Peter continues. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, but with gentleness and respect, right? So if you're irritated and you're frustrated, if you've allowed that harm to resonate in you, you won't speak with gentleness and you won't speak with respect. And uh, 
So that's what Peter's talking about. So believers should always be able to provide a rationale for why they believe what they believe, but in a way that is charming and righteous. Peter is admonishing believers to not give in to the fear mongering of those that are trying to intimidate them, you know, almost implying that they fear you, which is why they are trying to irritate and frustrate you. Um, they don't like what you stand for if, if, if you're an ardent Christ follower and you're not caving, man. They fear you. Um, they do. And they'll, they'll, they'll do it in a way to, to, to make you feel stupid and to make them feel superior to you. But if you're a Christ follower and you're putting yourself in a position where you're superior to everybody else, it's this kind of the same thing, right? Um, so anyway, um, I believe that people fear what God has to say, which is why they try to push him to the side. And that's why they're trying to irritate us and frustrate us in the first place. You know, those that choose not to believe in Christ can't make sense. It doesn't make sense to them why believers have a fear of God. They can't rationalize it because they're living up here, not in here. Um, nor can they comprehend why fear of God is stronger than fear of man. It boggles their mind. It, it pisses them off, quite frankly. You know, some are argue that this is because it grants a degree of confidence, right? So if you have a fear of God that is stronger than a fear of man, um, that then it gives you a, a degree of confidence that defies what some believe to be rational. Um, they just can't comprehend it. Since the heart is where Jesus exists, this is also where he prefers to be worshipped, right? So to sanctify in the modern sense means to make holy as far as God is concerned. And a process that begins with that initial justification, followed by the ongoing sanctification, and then our eventual glorification. So, however, most believe that Peter is making a reference to the Old Testament use of the word, which means to set apart. I'm talking about sanctify, sanctifying, um, such as setting apart things on the tabernacle that are specifically for God's use. Sanctifying Jesus as Lord implies that we are making Jesus the center of our lives, an approach that keeps us prepared for anything that comes against us that may require some form of defense or a testimony to others about um, our belief. And this also serves as a provision for courage for the future, um, either getting us through whatever it is that we're going through or the day that we pass from this earth. So think about what this meant for the church in the first century. When persecution was rampant in their communities, um, society, and even in their court systems, <laughs> we're seeing the same patterns today within American, on American soil. You know, the word for defense is the Greek word apologia, which is where we derive the idea of apologetics. Um, most people know or know, uh, or know of or heard of, at a minimum, Ravi Zacharias. Um, he was one of the most modern, in modern times, most prolific apologists of the modern era, you know, and he sadly passed away early in, in, in sometime in 2020. So in this case, Peter is using the word in an, kind of an informal sense, insisting that believers must understand what, what, what he believes. We have to understand what we believe and why we are Christians. And then you should then be able to articulate your belief in a way that is humble, thoughtful, reasonable, and biblical. You know, Peter concludes in verse 15 with a concern that believers need to remain gentle and respectful as the way we conduct ourselves can impact our witness to others. You know, this is kind of an argument that Peter has made a few times throughout this letter of first Peter. You know, we need to guard our hearts against becoming arrogant and prideful or even from getting preachy. This setting is different. We get preachy in this type of setting here, but we're talking about preachy out in, in the world. You know, some argue that the only arguments that matter in these cases are the stories about our experiences and why we have hope. We need to watch our behavior and maintain a good conscience that Peter continues into verse 16. Um, as nonbelievers are constantly looking for excuses to point fingers as they declare, aha, right? You're busted. Um, so in verse 16, Peter continues, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who disparage your good behavior in Christ, that they will be put to shame. Uh, you know, sanctifying Christ as Lord in our hearts gives us 
and an attitude of moral and ethical standards as outlined in God's word, which serves as part of our preparation when a defense and a testimony is necessary. And it also serves to protect us from slander and unsubstantiated gossip. You know, folks should automatically know when there's gossip and slander happening out there, folks should automatically know that those are lies, when they're lies. You know, a conscience accuses you and your conscience accuses you and makes you feel guilty, um, shameful. It's going to make you feel doubtful, fear, anxiety, or despair. A free life, one lived under the command and authority of the Lord, produces a good conscience, which causes false accusers to feel the shame of their own conscience, right? So eventually what he's saying is that good, that, 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 uh, people that are giving false slander, false witness, they're lying about you, right? That their conscience is going to eat them up from the inside. And eventually their lies will then be exposed. And then people are going to have an aha moment. That's what that's implying. But if you're living a free life in Christ, right, then you have a good conscience and you're clear and you can just keep on living your life knowing that you have what been zealous for good. One of the unfortunate truths, though, is that Christ followers are not always vindicated. We're not. And they continue to suffer um, from the slander and gossip for a long time. Some don't even recover, um, no matter how hard they try to overcome it. Um, it just continues to, to go on and on and on. That's the reality and the truth of the fallen world in which we live. And sometimes it can be discouraging if, if, you're, if you're living tr truly within a church body and you're surrounded by other followers and you're fellowshipping and you're doing all those sorts of things. You know, it can be discouraging about why do I continue to suffer? Why do I continue to go through this pain? Why do I continue to have all this stuff happen to me? But I'm watching my brothers and sisters that have gone through stuff, right? And they're successfully getting through things that were similar to what I'm going through. But yet my crap's been going on for five years, three years, 10 years, 12 years, one year, three months, whatever it happens to be. Hey, Steve. But yet we're watching other people get through it. And it can, it can hurt. You know, the comfort that we have in this case is that the Lord ultimately, ultimately, is going to judge your attacker, right? Which is one reason we have that, that we have that we can have courage during those times. So if you're going through suffering and it's lasting a long time and you're watching other um, uh, believers with you um, get through whatever they're going through faster than you for whatever reason, and there's a whole lot of circumstances and variables that impact that. The one thing that you can always have comfort in is that the Lord is ultimately going to judge. You may, be, you, may, you may suffer for the rest of your life until you die, but ultimately in the end, the, jor, the, the Lord is going to ultimately judge your attacker. And that should be comforting. So you may not experience personal satisfaction on this earth. And that is the truth. And I don't know that we all hear that a lot in churches. We don't hear that being preached on a lot, right? Is we want to be cushy and we want to, we don't want to, you know, like, I don't know if they want to alarm people or maybe it sounds discouraging to say that. And so we don't want to preach discouragement. We want to, we want to preach encouragement. But, you know, the truth is, is that you may never, ever, ever experience personal satisfaction on this earth. But... The encouraging part, the part that you can have comfort in, is that ultimately the Lord is going to judge everything. That is the encouraging part, right? So this is all, all of this together is likely why Peter is concerned with believers maintaining a spirit of gentleness and respect that he outlined in verse 15 a little bit earlier. So... Yeah, I'll continue with verse 17. Um, in verse 17, Peter says, For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Um, you know, this verse is an example of a shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, people suffered when they did wrong, whereas they were blessed when they did good. But in the New Testament... The principle is that you should expect to suffer for doing good. 
And in our world today, guess what happens? You'll be rewarded for doing bad, right? Abortion, bad. But you're rewarded and you're applauded, right, when you support it. You know, um, you are, it, uh, I can, I'm going to, I'll stop on that thought that you, you get, you get the point, right? Is that in the New Testament that you should expect to suffer for doing good and rewarded for doing bad. And that's a temptation for a Christ follower that is suffering and they're what, and they're continuing to suffer. No matter how faithful they are and they're just not recovering, they're not getting that personal satisfaction, but they're watching people that aren't doing good and they're watching them get rewarded. Guess what? Some hap some people happen. They backslide. They give it up. They're saying it's not worth it. It's painful. I don't know, whatever. Right. And so they cave um, and they, cause they want to be rewarded. They want to be comfortable in this life and they forget for some reason, what's going to happen to them when they get when when they're in front of the in, in the throne room of God and they're being judged for their lives? You know, one of the reasons I believe that this to be the case is because now the church's mission to share and witness the truth throughout the world, um, not just within the borders of Israel. So what I'm replying to is back to the argument about the shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament, right? So um, in the New Testament. Um, our church, the church's mission is to share and witness the truth throughout the world. In the Old Testament, is just within the borders of Israel um, or any singular nation. You know, doing this places Christ followers into more hostile locations that may cause them harm in one form or another. So anyway, we're going to conclude. We're going to stop there. And uh, in the next session, we'll start in 318 and finish off this section two about suffering um, when it's not fair. <laughs> All right. So anyway, amen. I hope that uh, you guys got something out of this. Um, again, I, I, I have fun doing this. I have fun sharing it. I have fun doing the, it. Well, it's not as fun doing the studies sometimes because it can be tedious, but I enjoy once it's all together and I enjoy sharing it. Um, and uh, anyway, amen. Have a blessed week. Happy New Year. It's 2021. Don't pay attention to Mad Max, which happened in 2021. I did a post on that earlier, but um, anyway. Um, amen. Rock on for Christ, not a women.